there is only one church that Jesus Christ established. And that church can be found in the New Testament. How does a person identify the true church? And there is only one true church. How do we identify it? You have to go to the Bible. How do we know which one is His, Christ's church, among all these denominations of men? The only way is to go to the New Testament to find the things there that identify the church of Christ and then to look about us today and find the church that exhibits those characteristics only in the New Testament can we find the marks of the true church which Jesus built. Now, first of all, and fundamentally and primarily, one of those marks is who built it. Look around at the religious world today. Look at denominations. Who built them? Who built the Baptist church? Who built the Methodist church? Who built the Catholic church? Who built the Lutheran church? I'm here to tell you, and the Bible tells us this, the New Testament reveals this, that Christ is the builder of His church. He didn't build any man's church. We'll get into it a little bit later, but Christ did not build Martin Luther's church. Martin Luther built His Christ built His. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning verse 13, the Scripture says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Thou art John the... uh, 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 They said, uh, Some say Thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Great statement there concerning the building of the church and the builder of the church. Now when Jesus asked His apostles, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? He wasn't looking for information. He already knew. John 2.25 says He did not need anyone to testify man for He knew what was in man and He knows what's in man. He knows what men are thinking. He knows what men are saying. So He didn't ask that question for His own information. He already knew that. He asked that question to make His apostles think. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He said, well, they're saying you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Why would they say that? What was it about Jesus that made them think of John? John was fearless. Jesus was fearless. Made them think about Elijah. He was fearless. Remember his contest with the 500 false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? It's the kind of fearlessness and courage that Jesus exhibited. Some say that are John the Baptist. Some Elias or Elijah or, or Jeremiah. Jeremiah who was fearless in his preaching. He wept over Jerusalem as Jesus later wept over Jerusalem. So, Peter answered him. He said, who do you say I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, as I think we pointed out in a previous lesson, he, he said something that nobody else had, had said. Some people might have thought he was the Son of God, and some people might have thought he was the Messiah. In fact, the Jews said, if you're the Messiah, show us, tell us, give us a sign. We want to see this. 
But Peter confessed who Jesus was completely. He's not only the Messiah. He's the Son of the living God. The Messiah. Thou art the Christ. Or the Messiah. The Son of the living God. And Jesus told Peter, He said, I'll I'll establish my church. Upon what? Upon what Peter confessed. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. And he said, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now he told Peter he would establish that church upon himself as the Son of God. Upon that great truth that Peter confessed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, I will build my churches. Now I'm getting some no's out there. And you're right. He didn't say churches. He said, I will build my denominations. No, he didn't say that either, did he? Look at it. Have your friends look at it. What is Jesus? What did he say? I will build my church. Singular. There's only one. Only one. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word hell there in this case is not the place of eternal torment. It's Hades. The gates of Hades. Hades is the is the realm of the disembodied spirits of men awaiting the resurrection. Hades is demonstrated to us in the account of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke, the 16th chapter. The rich man and Lazarus, both were in Hades. The rich man was in torments. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. That's Hades. There are two states. Some people say two places. I I think we... Maybe it would be better to say two states or uh, uh, two realms of existence, if you want to call it that, in Hades. Hades is where everyone goes when they die. A few years ago, I preached a a funeral for a very dear friend of mine, grand elder of the Lord's Church. And I made the point in the sermon that he is now in Hades. Hades. And after the funeral was over, his daughter approached me. And, well, she called me at the house. She said, I want to ask you something. Did you say my daddy was in Hades? And I said, yes. Hades, and I explained to her what that was, and then she understood. I, but, you know, people do not understand that. They think the word Hades means a place of eternal torment. Hades is a place where disembodied spirits go, and in part of Hades is a place of torments, but in the other is Abraham's bosom or paradise. Tartarus and paradise. And so what Jesus is saying here, the gates, the gates of a city represented its strength. The gates of a city were strong, it could not be taken. And he said, the gates of Hades, the power, the strength of Hades would not prevent his building his church. He said, I will establish, he's, what he's saying is, I'm going to establish my church and I'm going to do it after I die. And death's not going to prevent me from establishing my church. That's exactly what he was saying. The gates of hell. That was prophesied in the Old Testament. Listen to Isaiah 28, 16 through 18. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the lion and righteousness to the plummet. The hail shall sweep away the refuge of flies. And the water shall overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. You know what that was? That was a prophecy of the death of Christ. The Jews made an agreement with death. 
They made a covenant with death. An agreement with hell. And the word hell there is the same thing as in the New Testament. It's Hades. But in the Old Testament, it's Sheol. And it simply means the place of the dead. Just as Hades means that in the New Testament. And so Isaiah is prophesying that Jesus Christ would be consigned to the tomb. He would be put to death when the unbelieving Jews of His day would make a covenant or an agreement with death, an agreement with hell or Hades to put Him there. I think that would be the end of it. God said it will be disannulled. You know how his, you know how that covenant with death was disannulled? You know how the agreement with hell failed to stand? By the resurrection from the dead. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said God declared Christ to be His Son with power by the resurrection from the dead. That was God's final statement. He had said at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved Son. He had said on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And the third day after Jesus was crucified, God made the grandest and uh, the greatest statement of all without a voice by raising Him from the dead. Jesus Christ established His church after He arose from the dead. He is the only person in all of the history of humanity to establish a religion after He died. Everybody else had to do it before. Mohammed had to do it before. You know why? Because Mohammed's still in his tomb. Joseph Smith had to establish his his uh, doctrines of Mormonism before he died because Joseph Smith's still in his tomb. The tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. He reigns at the right hand of God on the throne of David today over his church. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church that Jesus built was the church He built after His death and it's the only church in which Christ saves man. So you can tell which church is the right church simply by its builder. The builder is Jesus Christ. So if, if you're involved with a church that has a builder other than Jesus Christ, then it's not Christ's church. It's not the one you read about in the New Testament. You can identify the church Jesus built also, not only by who built it, but by the time and the place of its establishment. The church of Christ was built, established on the day of Pentecost, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, according to Acts 2, and beginning verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all uh, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit descended. The glory of God descended. Fifty days after our Passover, Jesus Christ was crucified. Just as the glory of God descended on Sinai 50 days after Israel ate the Passover in Egypt. That was the beginning of the Old Covenant. This is the beginning of the New Covenant in Acts chapter 2. Any church that was begun at a place different from Jerusalem, at a place or at a time different from the day of Pentecost immediately following the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not the one that Jesus built. Now we'll give you some examples. That's not an exhaustive list, but uh, it makes people think. The Lutheran Church. It was built by Martin Luther, by the way. Takes his name. 
So the fact that he built it means it's not the one that Jesus built. It's not Christ's church. The Lutheran church began October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther protested against Catholic corruption. And he was right to do that, but he established a denomination which led, of course, to the Reformation. Now, the Catholic church existed prior to that, But it began much later than Pentecost following Christ's resurrection. The Catholic Church is a result today of a gradual apostasy at first. A step here and a step there away from from the divine pattern. Had a small beginning when the early church departed from the simple congregational form of government At first, one elder was elevated in each congregation above the others, and he was called the bishop. Then there began to be among the congregations uh, 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 elders, uh, certain elders, who were uh, elevated above the others, and you would have a bishop over two or three congregations, not the Lord's way. And it kept going, and it kept building steam, and it kept snowballing until finally... They had a pope in about 606 A.D. Established the papacy. And of course you know what we have today. The pope, the Catholic church, run by bishops. And so it was about the middle of uh, the second century when the Catholic church began. It's not the church Jesus built. Presbyterian Church began under the leadership of John Knox in Scotland. Its first book of discipline was written in 1560, and in 1592, Presbyterianism became the official religion of Scotland, the state religion of Scotland, almost 1,600 years too late to be the church that Jesus built. The Church of England, it was established by Henry VIII as a result of his quarrel with the Roman Pope who refused to annul Henry's uh, marriage to Catherine of Aragon so he could marry Anne Boleyn with whom he was already living. Henry persuaded the English Parliament to sever the connection of the Church of England and the Church of Rome and to make him, Henry, the head of the English church, and that was done in 1531. And I've always said, and I've written, and it's still true, the Church of England, which in this country is known as the Episcopal Church, may be the only modern denomination established by and because of a fornicating king. That's what the Church of England is. Neither the Church of England nor the Episcopal Church is the church Jesus established. Another man-made church that was established the wrong time, the wrong place to be the Church of Christ is the Methodist Church, known today as the United Methodist Church. In the old days, it was uh, known as the M.E. Church North, or Methodist Episcopal Church North, or the Methodist Episcopal Church South. But whatever they called it, and it's known today as the United Methodist Church, but whatever they called it, that organization was founded in England by a man named John Wesley and his brother Charles in the 1700s. 1700 years too late. 1700 years after Pentecost. Methodist Church is not the church Jesus established. No part of it. Not even a branch of it. The church Jesus established has no branches. The Baptist church is not the church of Christ. The first known Baptist church was organized in Holland by a man named John Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. And the first Baptist church in England was organized by Thomas Helwes in 1611. These efforts are 1,600 years too late to be the church that Jesus established. Wrong place, wrong time. The church Jesus established was prophesied to begin in Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountain shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. 
That was the prophecy of Isaiah. All nations shall flow unto it. And many people will, will say, uh, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. We will walk in His paths, and He will teach us of His ways, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now that's written in a Hebraism. That's saying the same thing in two different ways. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. When the word of the Lord went out from Jerusalem, the law went out of Zion. It's the same thing. Same thing. In, Matthew, in Luke 24, Jesus opened His disciples' understanding and said, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer the rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That's where it would begin. And that's where it did begin. Seventh-day Adventism began in Massachusetts, 1831, under the leadership of William Miller, poor old deluded William Miller, trying to set the date for the Lord's return and just couldn't get it right at all. The Mormon Church was established by the false prophet Joseph Smith on April 6, 1830, in Fayette, New York. Jehovah's Witnesses began in the late 1800s in the United States, as did Mary Baker Eddy's Christian Science Religion. All of these man-made churches have no likeness whatsoever to the church that was promised and built by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They originated too late, wrong, uh, too late at the wrong place, and were built by the wrong people to be the church that Jesus built. They're not it. Ask your friends, how is your church designated? You know, I see a lot of our own brethren saying our church nowadays. One of the first things I remember when I was a little boy, my grandmother, my mother, and my aunts were members of the Lord's church. And they taught me something. And one of the first things I remember them teaching me is don't say our church because it's not ours. It's the Lord's church. It's the church of Christ. So we don't say your church. But now, denominations do belong to men. So you can say to a denominationalist, to a denominationalist, how is your church called? Oh, well, they call my church the, uh, the first church of perpetual motion. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, where do you find that in the Bible? Oh, I, <laughs> you know, I never had thought of that. <laughs> Let me, well, I tell you, I don't have time to look it up. I'll ask my preacher. Where is it found in the Bible? The church of which you remember, how do you designate it? Well, it's designated this. Well, where is that in the Bible? Well, I can't find it right now. It's not there. It's not there. In the beginning, and even today, the church has no name. Has no name. People say, well, it's named the Church of Christ. No, it's not. That's a, that's a, a term of ownership. That's a possessive term. The Church of Christ is the church that belongs to Christ. That's not the name of the church. Not the name of it at all. I might say the, the automobile of Doug McClish. And I rode over here in it. But I haven't named it. Now automobiles do have names. <clears throat> but if I say the automobile of Doug McClish, I'm not giving you its name. I'm not telling you it's a Buick. I'm just saying who it belongs to. And the same is true with the term the church of Christ. That just tells who it belongs to. Not only that, but its members, the individuals in the New Testament, did not use party names. Paul condemned that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, some say I am of Paul, and others I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? That's what people do today. Well, I'm a, 
I'm a Christian. That's what I tell people. And I mentioned this the other day when I was in Dallas uh, this past week. A fellow asked me what I... what uh, I think he said, to what brand or something of religion? And I said, I'm, I'm a Christian. Well, what, yeah, but what... Uh, I said, I'm a Christian like you read about in the New Testament. That's all we are. We don't use party names. There's no such thing. You cannot find in the New Testament the term Baptist Christian or Methodist Christian or Catholic Christian or Pentecostal Christian. They're not in there. We need to get that through people's heads. And we in the church need to, need to uh, uh, understand these fundamental things so that we may teach others. They're just not in there. In the New Testament, individual followers of Jesus Christ are known only as Christians. Christian. We talked about that last night. How in Isaiah 62 it was prophesied the Gentiles would be included in the church and then God would give His people a new name. And that happened in Acts 10. The Gentiles were included in the church. In Acts 11, God gave His people a new name. Acts 11.26, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. A disciple of Christ is a Christian. A Christian is a disciple of Christ. Same thing. The disciples were called Christians. In the New Testament, there are no denominational names for individuals, just Christian. And that word Christian is only found three times in the New Testament. First of all, in Acts 11.26, they were called Christians first at Antioch. Then, Then when Paul was making his defense before Agrippa, and Agrippa spoke to him and said, Paul, Acts 26, 28, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Second occurrence. Third and last occurrence is found over 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning verse 15. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this behalf. Now what's he saying? Don't any of you be guilty of being a busybody, a murderer, an evildoer. Do not. And if you do and you suffer, then you deserve to suffer. That's basically what he's saying. But, if any man suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed of that. But let him glorify God in this behalf. I think the American Standard says, in this name. We glorify God in the name of Christian, because that's Christ's name. We wear His name. That's how the church is designated then. The church as a whole is called the church or the church of Christ. It's His. And you and I, who are members of it, are Christians. Individuals are Christians. So you look, in, uh, uh, look at the religious world and see if that's uh, the way these people are, are called over here, and if they are, what about the church of which they're members? Is it called the church of Christ? Are they called Christians? Did Jesus build the church of which they're a member? Yes. Well, then that's the church Jesus built. That's how we can identify it. And we identify it in other ways, by its organization. There's no councils, senates, conferences found in the New Testament. Each local church is organized on a level no higher than the local congregation with Jesus Christ as the supreme head. God gave Him and put all things under His feet. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, and 23. And gave Him to be the head over all things to the church which is His body. The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Speaking of Christ and His relationship, His headship over all the church. To all the saints which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. That's exactly the way Paul addressed the church at Philippi in Philippians 1 and verse 1. Each congregation under the headship of Christ is overseen by a plurality of elders or bishops. Same thing. Paul said to Titus in Titus 1, 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. A plurality of elders 
not one man ruling over a congregation, but a plurality, at least two, two or more, overseeing each congregation. No councils, no presidents, no bishops, uh, no state bishops, no state conference, just a local congregation overseen by elders, by its worship. You can identify it by its worship. There's no modern rituals. Uses only the five items of worship found in the New Testament. Singing, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Colossians 3, 16. Singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Teaching in our assemblies. 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So turn away from their, ear, their ears from the truth shall be turned unto fables. Preach the word. We preach in our assemblies. We teach the word of God. They continue steadfastly. Those Christians on, who were baptized on Pentecost, Acts 2.42 says, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That means in their teaching. It's part of our worship. Singing, teaching, eating the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted that and said, as, as oft as you drink it, you do, uh, or Paul said, as oft as you eat and drink this, you show forth the Lord's death till He come. 1 Corinthians 11. Jesus said this do in remembrance of me and the first century church did it every first day of the week. Acts 20 and 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So they eat the Lord's Supper weekly. The church prays to God as led by men. No women leading in worship. The Bible teaches that. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul gives some ground rules there, if you will, for public worship. And in Acts, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. The word men there, there are two words that are used for men or mankind. The word anthropos means mankind. And that encompasses both men and women. The human race. Anthropos. Anthropos. That's where we get the word anthropology. Study of of human beings. Anthropos. Man. But there's another word for man. And that's anir. A-N-E-R is the way it's spelled in English. The Greek word is, is anir. And that means a male, not not a female. Anthropos means male and female. Anir means a male. And anir is the word that Paul used there when he said, I will that men pray everywhere. He's talking about public worship. And he's saying men, males, must lead in public worship. And then finally, the fifth act of worship in which we engage is giving upon the first day of the week, laying by in store as God has prospered us. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Church is known by its worship, its organization, how it's designated, by its builder, by its terms of entrance. By its terms of entrance or terms of membership. They weren't given, those terms not given by human councils. They were preached by the apostles in the New Testament. Salvation by faith only is taught by most modern denominations. But the Lord's church doesn't teach that. Faith only is a doctrine of the devil. Faith only will not save. Now I want you to, uh, if you get a chance, to look up Article 9 of the Methodist Discipline. I have that. My grandfather Brewer was a Methodist preacher, by the way. Look up, I never knew him, he died in 1919. Nevertheless, uh, my great-grandfather on my mother's side uh, was a gospel preacher, and I have some of his books, and he has some all the way back to uh, the 
early 1900s or late 1800s. He had some, and they were he had several Methodist disciplines. Did you know the Methodists at one time believed all babies were born in sin? That was in their discipline. Then about, I, I don't remember the year, but it was about 1910 or 12, they changed it. They changed it. All babies were born in sin. And those who didn't get baptized died before they changed that. But I guess after they changed it, babies didn't need to be baptized. See what liberties men take with God's Word. And the Methodist discipline says in Article 9, wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. As I said, it's very full of comfort. That's true. But it's not wholesome. Believed and followed cause your soul to be eternally lost. Because salvation by faith only is a doctrine of the devil. The faith that saves is a faith that obeys the gospel that you read about in the New Testament. First of all, one, to be saved, one must hear the gospel. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing means to understand. just doesn't mean just to, to hear the sound of the gospel. It means to understand, to take it into the mind, to think about it. Once one hears and understands the gospel of Jesus Christ, then he must believe what he's heard and what he's thought about and what he's reasoned about. Hebrews 11.6 He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. In John 8.24 Jesus said, Except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. Having done that, one must repent of his sin. Luke 13.3 and then confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Acts 8.37, like the Ethiopian eunuch did. And having confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of God, he must then be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. That's what it says. Baptized for the remission of sins in order to have sins forgiven. When one does these things, he's added to the church that's identified in the New Testament. Acts 2.47 says, The Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. The Lord adds you to the church. You don't join. Now you can join a denomination. You can get voted in. Or however they want to do it. That's fine. If you want to do that. If you want to get into heaven, you need to have the Lord add you to His church add you to His church when you obey the Gospel. Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you haven't done that, then you need to if you want to go to heaven. If you're here tonight and you have done those things and you have wandered away from the Lord and become unfaithful, then you need to come home. You need to come back. You need to repent of your sins. Say, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going back to the Lord. Then you need to confess your sins to your brethren, ask them to pray for you, and God will forgive you.